So um, I hope you can see my screen. Yep. Yeah. Yes. Okay, great. So um, today I'll be discussing, uh, I've got something in my chat. Today I'll be discussing um, visual uh, inputs, visual processing, and how, um, and uh, memory. So vision affords us with many visual abilities and many ability, abilities in general. I mean, here are just very few of these um, that uh, we can think about, a very short list of what vision really does afford us with. Um, understanding what these um, things are, and I'm sure that some of you even understand that you cannot read this word because it's in a language you cannot, um, you're not familiar with. Um, understanding what people around us are doing, where they're going, uh, who people around us are, what emotions they're feeling, um, how do we get to places, where are we relative to where we need to attend or to move. And again, there are so many more uh, aspects that are driven by both uh, input from the outside, but also inputs from the inside, such as uh, if we realize that we're hungry, uh, we have an idea, uh, we envision what we want to eat, and we have to find our way uh, and get to either the refrigerator or to some place that has food in it. And again, all of these are uh, driven and afforded by our vision. And in general, we can say that um, vision is usually, um, visual functions are usually divided into two main uh, sets of functions, both perception, understanding what there is in the world around us, and also uh, preparation for action, where we use the visual information to guide us uh, within the visual environment as dynamic creatures to allow us to move in the environment without bumping into uh, things and harming our body and also allowing us to effectively um, manipulate and act on and within um, items in the environment. Um, but this is more, we can think about this as more being short term. Uh, what is currently happening in the immediate um, time frame, in the now time frame? But vision also interplays with uh, what has happened to us in the past and what will happen to us in the future. So uh, our visual representations and the fact that we understand the things we see and the way we perceive them is influenced by our visual experience throughout our lifetime. So our past visual experience and our, you can think about that, our visual memories, but also uh, our emotional memories related to visual information that we have encountered and semantic information all are influencing our current perceptual um, inputs. And also the information that we are perceiving now, perceiving and acting upon now may influence and guide information in our future, whether it's the near future or whether it is a few years away from now. And we can think about a very simple example is when we, let's say we've got normative face perception and we come across a new person that we are not familiar with now. And in five, 10 minutes, or even a week from now, we'll be able to recognize this person or at least recognize that we're familiar with this face, even if we won't have such a, uh, um, a rich semantic uh, association network that will allow us to remember where we met this person, for, uh, where we met them, uh, we will still be able to recognize that we've seen this face. So our current experience, we can think about it as being, um, uh, divided into perception and action, and yet is influencing and is influenced by different um, times in the past and future. But all of these are very complex uh, processes, um, and it is unclear, although we do them if, with amazing ease, we or our visual system, uh, it is unclear how the visual system actually figures out um, all of these uh, very um, demanding and computationally uh, complex questions. So I want to show you here a video, which is a very um, 
it's a video taken from a GoPro camera in a shopping mall in Tel Aviv. And although you can see that the visual scene is highly complex, there are many changes, many colors, um, um, dynamics and entities and uh, movements, uh, we are very easily understanding all of the information that we are being exposed to. Uh, the distances, the different entities, what belongs to who, etc. And I want to point out, even now, with when the video is uh, has reached an end, and we can see this one frame from the video, which is not of that high quality. We can see, uh, for example, here uh, a white patch, and here another white patch, and they may even be connected if we think about the physical information that reaches our retina, but I'm also, also quite sure that most of us would be able to easily uh, segment this and understand that this white patch belongs to this arm, whereas this white patch is uh, a part of this woman's uh, shirt, and they are probably more than a meter away. And the same can be said about these two white patches where, where they seem to be rather connected if we think about um, the um, physical aspects. And yet we know that this belongs to this um, young lady or teenager uh, and her shoulder ends here. And this belongs to, uh, and this area is already of this man's uh, shirt and um, which is about two or three meters ahead of this um, um, young girl. We could also understand, although we don't have, uh, we're not maybe that certain, but that these two girls are together. We can understand um, that there are things being sold here, uh, the time of day, the lighting direction, uh, the temperature, the distances between the entities around here, and so many more things that our visual system does, even without us being aware of that. Uh, again, with um, high ease or very easily. But um, when we contrast this with all of the information that we know about the visual system, and we know a lot from lab, mostly from lab-based uh, based settings, and also mostly um, that have mostly been um, investigating perceptual aspects, not only, but mostly. We can think of um, very typical lab-based settings um, that have uh, usually are performed uh, on flat screens, um, usually in fixed distances from the viewer um, when um, most of the time, not all the time, most of the time information is being uh, presented in central vision, sometimes peri, uh, parafoveal vision, but again, and even if we go into um, distances in the visual field, such as uh, 10 or 15 degrees, it's still um, far more limited than we have when we have naturalistic vision. And I'm inviting you to use your fist and you can create some kind of tunnel vision that is very wide that will almost um, capture all of your screen, which would be, let's say, 15, 20, even 25 degrees, but you can still see that using such tunnel vision is very limiting. And if we had to walk around or even uh, look around, I'm seeing Jeremy something about search, uh, searchlight <laughs> window, it would be very difficult um, to find uh, to find your way, and uh, even when reading or looking at a face, when we don't have the peripheral information that would guide us towards uh, to perform saccades there and to understand the whole scene. And the fact that things are flat, again, look around you, apart from this Zoom um, seminar, things are not on a flat screen and are probably in many different distances around you. So our visual system has to deal with uh, much more information. And well, my point is that uh, we know a lot about the visual system, but very little. And it's like a window that we have um, uh, into the information that we know about how vision is being processed. And in my lab, we try to understand how visual behavior, and that includes all the information, all the stuff that I've described until now is related to visual system organization, whether it is um, how it enables us 
um, how visual system organization enables us to um, to um, visually behave, but also uh, limits us. So just a brief overview uh, that is part of this not so short introduction. Um, when this eye or this human uh, visual system is uh, looking into this uh, into uh, this uh, visual field, let's say fixation is over here and we've got information from the upper part of the visual field landing on the lower uh, hemiretina and information from the lower visual field landing on the upper hemiretina and from there information is passed on through the optic nerve the LGN uh, through the optic radiation, mostly reaching retinotopic cortex where we've got ventral areas in retinotopic cortex, um, such as ventral V1, V2, and V3, uh, processing information from the upper part of the visual field and information in the dorsal aspects of retinotopic cortex is coding information from the lower part of the visual field. Um, now, it, usually retinotopic cortex are assumed to be um, contributing to both, to all specialized uh, functions in the anti more anterior specialized regions, where we have the common hypothesis is that we've got two pathways, the ventral pathway with more specialized regions being more sensitive to faces, text, colors, um, objects. Uh, leading to recognition and understanding what there is around us and the dorsal pathway that is more related to spatial um, uh, navigation, attention, preparation for action. Um, all of these specialized uh, functions are using and relying on information from both retino ventral and dorsal retinotopic cortex. But I can ask you all to unmute yourself and um, if you wish, and tell me where does our body lie in the visual field, your own body? Where does it usually uh, preside? On the Zoom screen. It's right, it's right <laughs> below, there. Below. Oh, I don't know. I can always see my nose. <laughs> really? <laughs> I got a big nose. Okay, okay, well, that's an exception. I mean, okay, I'm just going to ignore this. <laughs> I actually, it, it, it okay. below, though. excluding your face. Up. Okay, so yeah, okay, so yes, in the bottle in the bottom part of the visual field, and actually, um, if you think about that, it's not only in the lower part of the visual field, as our eyes are at the top of our body, you can think about that way, uh, our body usually falls at the peripheral or far periphery in our lower visual field. Now, uh, we do have more information, uh, somatosensation, vestibular information coming from our body. So it's not that we only use vision, but definitely uh, our body interacts with the world most of the time when it is in the lower part of the visual field. Now, why am I saying that? Because um, our visual system has to allow us to uh, manipulate to guide our body for its um, um, planned actions and uh, not to uh, harm itself in the environment. And that is a process that has to be done um, in the areas that process most of the time the lower visual field. And it's not only the specialized areas. We assume that this starts already earlier on in the dorsal aspects. Now, maybe I'm wrong and this hypothesis will turn out to be um, incorrect, but our hypothesis, our underlying hypothesis is that there are differences in the processing and mainly probably especially in the peripheral aspects of dorsal versus ventral visual areas. So I don't know if it's only functional or if it's also structural. And again, that's the hypothesis, but it may be proven to be wrong. But um, I'll continue. So a few years ago, I've proposed that there's a, um, on top of the two main streams of the ventral and the dorsal uh, streams, there's another uh, very quick and rapid motion pathway that receives, and this is based on numerous studies, uh, including uh, neurophysiology, um, cytoarchitecture, connectivity studies, patient studies, that there is, um, and developmental, uh, that there is um, 
another pathway that is very quickly and swiftly passing on information um, through uh, the motion related areas, mainly the hub is MTV5 and then its satellites MSTD and MSTL. And these together with V1 um, um, pass on information bypassing the visual hierarchy to many uh, areas according to the task at hand, whether it's to the ventral stream, if it has to do with defining uh, objectness, such as it is the case with motion coherence, if it has to do with kinematics going into um, 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 STS and ventral premotor cortex, uh, eye movements going into the frontal eye field, if it has to do with optic flow going into V6 and V6A, and if the task is related to attention and uh, preparation for action to the dorsal stream. Uh, and uh, indeed, we can see uh, from um, um, anatomical um, studies that uh, the highly myelinated um, Connect, connection, direct connection between V1 and MT, uh, V5 um, allows for about two millisecond uh, different in latencies between the responses of V1 and MT, V5. Um, and if we look at the original Fellman and Vanessen um, hierarchy, and I've highlighted here the regions that are associated with the dorsal stream and the ones that are associated with the ventral stream and the ones that I associate with the motion stream. Uh, and this um, original visual hierarchy was based on structural connections, but if we take time into account in the dynamics, we can see that MTV5 can be placed in the same hierarchical um, um, level as V1, if we take into account latencies, M MSTD and MSTL um, on the next level, and in general, dorsal is slower than the motion-related areas, but faster than ventral information processing. Um, and again, we can think about visual field as also distinguishing between these two, uh, three streams where MT and MST um, represent the whole visual field, allowing information again to be passed on according to task to any other region that requires this information. Um, there's also, there are also studies by um, uh, Rosa uh, and with Tweedale or with um, Bourne that um, <clears throat> conceptualize and um, examine uh, MTV5 as a primary visual areas together with V1, A1, and S1. So primary area as opposed to the other extra striate areas. And uh, this is based on different species and additional aspects related to that. But um, the more important aspect is uh, of this model is the fact that it has many predictions. And I will only relate to a few of them today but it has its different dimensions, uh, but um, some of them relate to visual field and proximity. And this is what I'm going to be um, relating to today in, this, in the project that I'm going to be describing. Uh, so we can see that there are different spatial sensitivities where dorsal would be uh, of lower and closer visual field and ventral would be more sensitive to further away and higher uh, the higher part of the or the upper part of the visual field and this is from the observer's point of view. So in this first project we set out to examine whether lower visual field is closer than upper visual field. Um, now this may be intuitive to you or it may be completely against your intuition but we wanted to quantify this um, and to see where there is actually a difference. So here you can see our the pupa labs device that we have used. Uh, here we can see that there are, um, Alicia's actually wearing glasses, but uh, the device is around here. And I can already say that sadly the eye tracking um, part did not work, which is a limitation of the results that, I, believe, uh, that will, I will be presenting. But we did do analyses that can in a way overcome that to some extent. Uh, and here is the camera, the uh, Intel D415, where we had a world camera that you can think of as being like a GoPro kind of camera. Uh, and next to it, 
uh, is the IR projector that allows to get depth information from uh, a walking or a moving around individual in the environment. And I would like to show you a few videos. So this is one of the videos where a person is walking down the stairs with this device on um, his or her head. And you can see here above for each frame, we analyze the upper and the lower part of the frame, the uh, higher um, <clears throat> um, the values here, the closer it is. We can see here the depth um, video where um, red is closer and blue is further away. Um, and this is it was both indoors and um, also outdoors. And we can see that most of the time along the video, there are differences between the upper part, the mean of the upper part and the lower part. Um, this is another video that we took um, kind of like in a more wooden, uh, you know, wooden, you would, you know, we don't have these, these many forests in Israel, but um, some wooden environment. And you can see that even when the treetops are entering uh, the frames, um, most of the time there are uh, vast differences between the um, information from the upper and lower part of the frame. And this is from a passenger next to the driver's seat. Uh, we can again see that there are differences, although they may be a little smaller. And again, we can see here in the depth video, all these black areas that are uh, lacking or missing information. But from the information that is present, we can see most of the time there are differences. Uh, we did many analyses, which I'm not going to go into, but in general, we um, examined uh, four environment types, either walking outdoors, walking indoors, uh, in a driving car, and also in screens when people are just sitting and uh, manipulating their phone, the computer, or watching TV. And then we analyzed, this is one of the analyses that we ran. We um, um, looked at the upper and lower part of each frame and we examined uh, the differences, whether there are any differences between them. And we can, uh, most of the time, so in the car and in outdoor uh, environments, more than about 95% of the time, there are significant differences uh, and uh, lower, uh, the lower aspect of the frame is significantly closer than the upper part. Uh, in indoors, it's only about 75% of the time, and in screens, it's about 80% of the time. Now, this is, again, limited to the, um, to the uh, environments we have sampled, which are accumulated to about 40 minutes of video that we analyzed. So if we think about the visual environment, we can think that this is actually the input that comes into the visual system. And then there is the processing. Uh, which we may treat at the moment as a black box. And then there's the output. And the output is our behavior, whether it's the decisions we have to make, um, uh, judgments, or how we behave in the world. So the information based on the analysis that we have carried out shows that the lower part of the visual field is closer. Uh, we Even if we treat this as a black box, we wanted to examine if this output is influenced by the input asymmetry. Um, so our judgments, are they influenced by this? And Rafi here, I want to thank you because Rafi, uh, when he saw this, he said, well, you know, there's an asymmetry, but if it doesn't influence behavior, it's not that interesting. So <laughs> we carried out, uh, you have programmed this uh, online experiment. Um, um, this is the first phase of examining this. Uh, it was either run on smartphones or in computers and people had um, two uh, areas or two, uh, two circles that they had to judge uh, which of them was closer. They had to report whether it was the blue circle that was closer, the red circle that was closer, or whether they seemed to be equally distant from the camera. And for each of these frames, which were carefully picked by Yoav, we had the depth information from the videos that we took. And about a third of the frames were uh, that the lower um, uh, circle was closer, um, ha a third were that the upper and a third were that they were equal. Um, we ran 190 uh, participants um, with um, various versions where we tried to uh, make sure that our, our instructions are well understood. And the most critical um, 
condition is the condition when the uh, two circles were actually equidistant, um, the, when they were equally distant from the um, uh, camera. And what we find here is that in this uh, situation, 55% of the time people say that the lower um, circle is closer. Um, and only 11% of the time they are mistaken to say that the upper visual field is closer. So we have a five-fold difference or a five-fold bias into saying that upper visual field is closer even when it's precisely uh, the same distance. Uh, we also see this um, bias in the errors that people make when lower is actually uh, closer. People are more um, precise and make less errors, whereas when the upper circle is closer, people make more mistakes to, and judge them more as equal or as lower being closer. So there is um, a lower closer perceptual bias. Um, following um, Zwiganel and Mel Goodell's paradigm where they examined um, and found perceptual biases using when stereopsis and oculomotor information was present, when people had to either um, um, to estimate either manually on the side, uh, the size or the length of these uh, lines, or they are, as uh, in our study here, they are also um, able to actually, you can see here, um, really uh, touch the object uh, with uh, uh, really um, estimating it when uh, seemingly touching, although the information here was 2D and there was no real uh, feedback from the information. It was just the fact that people were using um, their fingers to uh, conceptually or um, apparently um, uh, grasp, grip it. So it was found that when people do this manual estimation and are not touching uh, the object, there is a perceptual um, bias or perceptual illusion. Um, but in these cases, stereopsis and oculomotor information was present, even though it may not have been very uh, informative. So we set out to understand whether in our case, since stereopsis and oculomotor information, sorry, was not present in this 2D design, uh, which was based on flat screens, we wanted to understand whether, going back, whether this may be the fact or the reason why we're getting this uh, perceptual bias. And so you have um, designed and ran a VR experiment where we had, you can see here, there are two circles, again, similar to uh, what was um, present in the um, um, 2D experiment in three environments, either forest-like environment, house, or urban um, environment. And we only had, we had, again, a third of the trials were of equidistant uh, distances, and we can, can show you this video again, but um, and people had to judge which circle was closer. We also varied the circle, the size of the circles to compensate for any uh, apparent uh, information that may be um, um, may be conveyed by the circle size. And again, we find that. 67% uh, of the time, the error bars here are, by the way, standard deviation, so they are uh, eff effectively um, smaller if we look at the um, standard of the min. But um, we find that 67% of the time in the equidistant condition, people judge the lower, uh, the lower circle to be closer, and only a third of the time they judge it to be uh, the um, upper circle. Again, they, in this design, they did not have the option to say that they are equally distant. Um, so, and this was um, again highly significant, although it was only a two-fold and not a five-fold bias, as we found in the 2D experiment. So, um, to sum up, we found that in this project, that information uh, is. Uh, the information that is entering our visual system is asymmetric, uh, where lower visual field information is closer. And uh, when we have to judge things in um, 2D, 
um, environment, this influences, or it seems that this is, I, I can't, um, um, we, we don't have uh, any proof for causal relation, but we did run um, um, a model. And this suggests that um, this is due to the, the, the difference in perceptual and in the perception and the perceptual bias is driven by this asymmetry in the visual information. Sorry, Uri, I, I muted you just uh, to be on. If, um, and, uh, and in 3D, we found that there's a significant perceptual bias, even if the magnitude of the perceptual bias is smaller, it's still highly significant. Um, so um, although I have not shown you any information that is directly related to visual processing, um, this project suggests, or we think it suggests that the differences or the differences in processing starts already in written poppy cortex at the early stages of visual processing, not at the retina. I don't know about the retina that much, but uh, already in early retinal poppy cortex. But again, this is just an hypothesis. Um, in another project where we also wanted to examine um, what happens in more naturalistic vision, also taking into account uh, information processing in visual cortex, we wanted to uh, examine whether image size influences image memorability. Now, when you are seeing these images here, and this was uh, led by Shaima Masarwa and Olga Kreitschman, which are PhD students of mine. So when you see these images, despite their very different size, I would assume or maybe hope that you understand quite well what is going on in each of these images. Um, if that's you can, if that's not correct, or I don't know, if you find it hard to understand what's happening in these images, uh, you are most welcome to uh, to say so or to raise your hand. Um, but um, it is uh, it is uh, commonly um, assumed that we've got and also found in. Um, different studies that there are perception is uh, size and variant to some extent. And also this is seen in high level visual cortex where uh, information processing, uh, both in your physiology and in your imaging shows a certain level of size and variance. Um, nevertheless, we assumed that since information processing in early uh, stages of uh, the, the processes, uh, convey uh, or um, rely on more visual system um, resources, we assume that this may influence um, information processing and uh, processes that are beyond perception. Uh, so just a brief re uh, reminder, when we have uh, this image in the visual field, on the retina and uh, the bigger an image is, the bigger portion of the retina it would fall on. And even if we uh, ignore or uh, put aside the magnification factor that we have in retinotopic cortex, we see that the larger the image, the more surface area that it requires or that it um, uh, elicits in, high, in um, um, retinotopic cortex. So um, we thought that since bigger images do rely on more processing resources starting from the retina, they would eventually influence the information or uh, that passes on to areas even uh, outside um, visual, uh, the visual system. Or I can rephrase this and say that we assume that the quality of information processing in the early visual cortex and in early visual processes does influence higher level cognitive processes, for example, memory. Um, and so we ran a set of experiments, um, I'm not going into also all of these details, but you are most welcome to ask. In general, people viewed uh, in all of the experiments four blocks of images of different sizes. Uh, we placed them in blocks um, so that, and they were not randomly ordered to um, um, 
this may go against us, but we thought that uh, this would be better for the smaller images, because if small images mass by a big image, um, then it is even less likely to be remembered. So um, smaller images um, blocked together may allow people to uh, focus their attention consistently on that uh, area and maybe um, make it easier to remember. But the people were not asked to remember. They were just asked to look and uh, look at the images and um, view them um, as they wish. And uh, each image was showed for two seconds. And then later on, after um, after they were um, seeing these 160 images, they were given a surprise memory test where they were asked to uh, to indicate for each of the images if they recall seeing it earlier or not. Each image in this um, in this second phase was presented for 500 milliseconds, and we found that. Uh, this was consistent across experiments when we changed, uh, when we swapped the images, when we changed the order of the blocks, when we also examined um, the visual angle uh, in the real, the, sorry, the visual size in the real world and screen resolution. It, throughout all of these, we found that the retinal image size had an influence um, uh, on memory. And although um, visual um, memory wasn't that great, uh, there was a significant effective size. Um, we then set out to try and look for uh, it, what happens between these these two sizes, the three by three and the twenty one by twenty one. Uh, and so we looked into we looked um, at parametric investigation of this effect. We took images from the MEM data set from Odd Oliver's lab. Uh, each of these had, each of the images had memorability score, and Shima uh, handpicked them so that we would get a very well balanced memorability score across the sizes, and as can be seen here. And we also calculated their mean luminance and found that they were more or less comparable across the across each of these sizes. And again. And we took images from four classes, people, faces, indoor and outdoor places. And we found that, again, there was significant effective size with um, six degrees being more remembered than three, 12 more than six. And although there is on average a uh, slightly higher uh, performance for 24 by 24 degrees, this was not a significant uh, difference. And we also found a category difference, which was uh, replicating previous uh, results of earlier studies that faces are remembered more and outdoors the least. Um, we also examined for each of these images uh, whether an image on its own is more memorable when it's presented at different sizes. So uh, you can see here. On the left, uh, we examined two data sets from two experiments that we ran in the initial version where each image was presented. If it was presented in one version in three degrees, it was presented in the other version, uh, in the other experiment in 21 degrees and vice versa. Images that were presented in 21 degrees in the first version were presented at three degrees in the, um, um, in the other experiment. And so each image had an average memorability across the participants from one version and from another version where the only difference was the size that, that it was presented in. And we can see that for most images, uh, when they're presented as in 21 by 21 degrees, they are above the diagonal line where the diagonal is um, the equality line. Uh, not all of them, but most of them. And uh, as I will show you here, it's significant, this um, uh, effect. And here we can see this in the in the experiment in the parametric experiment where images were presented. We had two versions, so it was either three degrees and twenty four degrees for half of the images, and the other half were presented either as six degrees or twelve degrees. And again, we see that in both cases, for a specific image, when it's presented as larger image as larger, it is better remembered across the group than when it is presented at small. And this effect is also persisting, although to some was a bit of a lesser extent when we compare the six and the 12. And this can be seen here. These are the averages. And these um, 
plots are the same data plotted here, but in a different form. Um, also, and again, this is a criticism um, by Rafi, but also by the reviewers, uh, that maybe the whole issue is the information content that is available in the bigger images and it's nothing else. So uh, we also ran a control where we took small sharp images and enlarged them and then Gauss and then applied the Gaussian blur to um, get rid of all the pixelation um, so that the amount of information present in these large blurred images will not be more than the um, amount of information present in the sharp smaller images. So this was the critical contrast, whether these large blurred images will be remembered more than the small sharp images. We also had small blurred and large sharp just to have a balanced design. And we can see the critical condition is that people remember the blurred bigger images more than the small small sharp images. Uh, there is again another um, uh, contribution of the details of course which is expected but this is the critical uh, condition. The size does influence um, the memory on its own even when it does not convey more information. So if quality of early visual processing is um, is really what is driving this. And again, I have not shown you that it is the quality, but this is what we hypothesize. And this is what led us to this study. Um, there is another question that may be, uh, why would it only be related to size? What about contrast? I mean, we know that contrast also influences, even when there's some level of contrast invariance in high level vision, in high level visual cortex, we know that different levels of contrast do influence information processing uh, in early visual stages. And so this study was again led by a master students of mine, Limor Bork, uh, and together with Olga and Shaima, uh, Limor examined what happens if you would manipulate contrast of images and if that would also affect visual memory. Again, naturalistic encoding, no task, which may modulate uh, the whole um, um, the whole uh, effect or processing in general, because we know task can modulate even receptive field size and information processing, processing even at LGN and V1. So initially, uh, Solimo took these images uh, that the original images from the MEM database that we used um, in the original size um, experiment. And they had very different contrast, as can be seen here. This is in RMS values. They've got different um, contrast levels. So um, she normalized them um, using a, a MATLAB um, script that she wrote to a very uh, more or less common uniform contrast level so that they will all be beginning from some basic um, equivalent contrast level. And um, so they had the same memorability score in the original version. And, um, and then we manipulated the contrast. You can see here, although each image was only displayed once in one of the contrast levels, no image was displayed um, in a few, um, no image was repeated. This is just to show how one image can uh, look when it is presented at 7.5 RMS, 15, 30, and uh, 60 uh, RMS units. So this is these are different images and what happens to them when we change the contrast level. And these were the levels that we chose for the uh, experiment. So people viewed either a block of 7.5, a block of 15, of 30, and of 60, each of them composed of these different categories. And then not knowing anything about the memory tasks that would follow. And then they were given a surprise memory test with an intermediate contrast level uh, where they were asked to say for each image if they remember seeing it earlier or not. And what uh, Limor finds is that there are, we found a significant uh, effective contrast level 
where uh, 15 uh, images that are presented within 15 uh, RMS units are remembered significantly more than 7.5, and the ones that are remembered uh, that are presented in 30 are remembered much more than 15, but there was no significant difference between 30 and 60 RMS. Again, I'm showing you what these differences are here. Um, and we can see, we also, um, the statistics also reveal that there's a significant category effect as we found earlier for the size. Um, and following the analysis, we, I didn't say, but we had 39 uh, participants that have done this so far and based on them, 19 of them did one version, 20 did another version. Limor also ran this uh, analysis where she examined if the memorability across that group is higher for an image that is presented at 60 RMS relative to 7.5 and 15 versus 30. And again, we see significant differences where most images are more remembered across the group when they are, remem when they are presented um, um, in higher contrast. And this is uh, also present, but to a lesser extent, in these two contrast levels. And these are the averages in the memorability benefits. So, um, Along these lines, I'm almost done. Along these lines, uh, we've got additional studies in our lab that look into eye movements, uh, brain activation in parafovial vision and um, during control, but also free viewing behavior, which uh, reveal interesting um, insights about visual functions and visual system organization, but I don't have time to go uh, into more of these. So, um, I can summarize before I go and thank my lab to say that um, much about vision is still unknown. And uh, if we can keep um, visual system organization and the idea uh, and to, uh, to think about how visual information is processed and take that into account when we try to understand how visual system works, uh, we may find out uh, a lot more about vision than we uh, think we know at the current state, uh, influencing both visual processing and additional functions that are way beyond vision. So I'd like to thank my lab and um, the, all of them. Uh, the studies I've described were carried out by uh, Olga, Shaima, Yoav, and Imor. Um, you can contact us. Oh, where did my screen go. You can contact us um, if you want to have uh, want to hear more details. And um, we are also recruiting postdocs, MSc and PhD students. Um, and thank you very much for your attention. Um, that's it. And <laughs> I'd be happy to take questions or if you don't have any, that's also okay. Yeah. Yes, uh, Jeremy. Um, so I was wondering about the relationship of your um, lower field stuff to um, the reach space things that uh, Talia Conkle and Emily Josephs have been interested in. Um, you know, how, how much how much of this has to do, or is, is this related to the fact that there's this peripersonal space where you can do stuff with your hands? Um, okay, so I have to look into uh, their studies uh, more carefully, but in general, I can say that we reach for things that are at the lower part of the visual field and also at the upper part of the visual field. We, it's not only that we reach um, things in the lower part of the visual field, but definitely, um, we do direct our gaze uh, toward the goal uh, of the object that we want to reach so that usually our hand, even if something is um, in the upper, um, next to in an upper part of the wall or very high up, uh, our hand would reach it from below. This is usually what is uh, what would happen. And so I think that the processes that allow us to plan our actions are more efficient in the lower part of the visual field, but 
I'm not answering directly your question because I have to see precisely what they have done. <laughs> to, okay. uh, yeah, sorry. Marissa? Hi, very nice talk. Um, I was wondering if you could tell us how far from the vertical meridian the objects that you were placing were, because in perception we have found many asymmetries, but they are driven mainly by the vertical meridian, and we find the corresponding difference we look at vertical magnification. Yeah. Or so definitely. Population refills. So, um, and then they, they release very gradually. So how far apart were they from the vertical meridian? Yeah, okay, so this is a great question and maybe we have to look into that. We have not analyzed it uh, relative, so we could have done that and I will, I haven't shown that, but um, I can say that at the center of the visual field, I would definitely think that at 10, 15 degrees, there may not be that much of a difference or much smaller and that the difference uh, grows as you move up uh, and down or further away on the vertical meridian. And I would also like to say that um, the, um, uh, the device that we use to record only recorded from let's say 40 degrees, so 20 up and 20 down. Uh, but I can say that our body does not, mm -hmm. is not even within that visual field. So maybe, uh, and I cannot say at the moment yeah. if um, what happens further away, maybe this difference um, is, um, is, is smaller or maybe it's uh, even uh, more enhanced. So it's hard for me to generalize to further away areas, but it definitely it's a great idea. We'll, we'll examine it by, uh, distance from the center because maybe most of the effect we get is from the more distant maybe it's from the upper and lower fourth of the image which would be the beyond 10 degrees i would analyze distance from the vertical and from the horizontal too right because when you look at the vertical meridian asymmetries actually become more pronounced with with distance with eccentricity as well as with spatial frequency yeah. And there's competitive information. So um, yeah, it would be really interesting. And I would love to know that. <laughs> Great idea. Okay, well, I'm writing it down. I mean, we have it recorded, but yes, uh, we will go into that definitely. Thank you for the suggestion. Thank you. Nitsan? Yes, hi, very nice talk. Uh, I appreciate uh, the control you did there in, in the second study, but I'm still curious about um, the possible dissociation between uh, just immediate visual perception and memory. Um, I mean, for example, if you would just uh, create an experiment where you measure a psychometric curve with uh, x-axis being one of the dimensions, say visual angle, um, and, and, and for the small uh, visual angle, it will be somewhere way below threshold, for example, let it be detection or discrimination, never mind. Then, I mean, in that extreme case, it's just an example to illustrate my, my thought. In that extreme case, you wouldn't be surprised that it's not memorized, right? Because it's, it's below threshold of perception. So, um, but, but then along the entire uh, axis, could this be the case that it's a perception rather than a memory thing? So, uh, definitely, it could be that there are differences in perception. I mean, I showed you in the beginning uh, these images and asked you if you understand, I mean, like if we all understand what's in the images, but definitely the fact that we're able to name uh, and to say, yeah, there's a child running in the field or there's a, there are two children running or something like that does not mean that the quality of information or that our perception is really the same. So it could very well be that uh, the fact that there are less details, the fact that maybe there are, um, I, so if, okay, I'll say it another way. Maybe there are things that we cannot verbally describe that are qualitatively very different between these image sizes. And so that this distinction or the difference starts way be, uh, before the memory aspect, that it's already present in the perceptual uh, 
uh, and early processing stages. And that is what eventually influences um, um, what is um, 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 etched into our memory. So I would say definitely could be the case that it's uh, that there are many differences in, uh, driven by size that we are still not aware of or are not knowledgeable about, but it may, yeah, clearly. Okay, thank you. Rafi, now Great I'm- Great talk, uh, Sharon. <laughs> thank you, I'm holding yeah. uh, tight my chair because <laughs> for the criticism that may come, yeah. Okay. Uh, sort of a continuation of Nitsan's question, but in the contrast domain, <clears throat> I mean, your general hypothesis is that it has to do with the quality of uh, early visual cortex. But looking at the contrast result, it seems to me more uh, related to the activation in high order visual areas. I see Galia is here, and I remember looking at activation, changing contrast, and a, a, the contrast changes continuously in early visual cortex, the effect, yeah, but in high order, it saturates very quickly, exactly around this kind of contrast that you stop seeing the effect. So I wonder whether you might think that it relates to activation in high order rather than low order cortex. Uh, definitely, I think I, I actually think that all of these areas uh, contribute to the effect that we, we that we find. It could also be related to, for example, even eye movements that are maybe different. And this is data that we should be analyzing that may be different um, when we have lower contrast and the contours are uh, not as um, sharp. But definitely it could be, and this is also related to what Dan Nitsan has um, asked, that this has to do with the perceptual quality and the fact that when you get that the level of uh, activation in high level visual areas would be a good indication of the memory level that uh, we find. But we haven't looked into that yet. We haven't, I mean, we've got a bit of data on the size, but not uh, not on the contrast yet. Thank you. Josh. Hi, Sharon. Um, let me ask a preliminary question just so that I, I don't get too far afield because I remember that your psychological results were that you found a bias uh, for things that were in the lower visual hemifield and you found an improvement in memory or perhaps a bias of allocating uh, memory resources to large things um, in the in the visual field. You're, are you suggesting that those, let's just in general call them biases, are related to the first result that I remember well was showing that things that are lower in the visual field tend to be closer. Okay. Do you think those biases are, are, are you suggesting those biases are a function of visual diet? Um, so the, these are two different projects, but I can say that uh, with the size aspect, the information that was presented was on 2D screens. And so it's very hard for me to say if the results generalize to information within the uh, 3D environment around us. Um, I do not know, and this is not something that we have tested, whether uh, if we manipulate, this is something that we may be able to do with VR, but um, um, I'm not sure that when you have um, different uh, visual angle, but that is embedded in the 3D environment around you, we would see the same uh, results. In, um, so I'm not sure about that. Um, um, definitely, it could be that all of the that all the um, that all our results have to do with uh, the perceptual processes, or you can think about more ventral related uh, analyses that go into memory. And there's no action or preparation for action related processing. Um, and I, we have eye data that would allow us to examine where people are looking and maybe we can also relate to this analysis and to, to try to see if they are looking more into um, 
upper or lower part of the image. But in general, I can say that um, um, oh, yeah. I did not think that this has to do with uh, with the fact with preparation for action. Okay, I uh, I guess you 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 kind of address my idea. That, which might be completely based on something that I was thinking about and was not part of your talk, but um, it was your way of manipulating the, the imp, um, I don't know what to call it, the general stimulus or the, the general environment rather than try to manipulate what an individual observer was looking at. I thought it might be interesting to look at individual differences, different sort of groups of people that have different visual diets or different action constraints, um, different I, cultures or something like that. Anyway, I, I, yeah. that's, that was my only idea. No, that's great. And I can, I can say that uh, we, I haven't presented that and we haven't published that, but I can say that when we look at the people, at the 180 people that have done this, uh, and they are not from different, uh, you know, they're more or less the same university students, uh, same age, uh, etc. But we see um, uh, enormous individual variability in the effect of um, size influences. Um, it's only young adults, uh, but definitely there could be also cultural differences um, in other aspects that are maybe related to, develop to developmental conditions that we haven't uh, examined. So this is only in a normative adult um, population, uh, let's say normative vision. Um, so I don't know, um, but there are individual variability mm -hmm. and, and many differences. Thank you. Um, Bob? Yes, I was very interested in the early part of the talk and uh, about upper or lower. And I wanted to ask you whether, do you think that these results mean that um, objects in the lower field should look smaller because they're, this, that is the same size, the same retina topic uh, uh, um, something should look smaller in the lower visual field? Um, well, I, Maybe, so I don't remember that. It sounds to me that what you're saying, suggesting is right, but we did notice when we, when we moved to the VR experiment, that when we had the circle that I showed you uh, be present in upper and lower part, and we made it be the same visual angle, it did not look like it's the same size. So there was- yeah, Because there's this normalization with the uh, distance. So yeah. Perceived, so you, you might, that might be a way of measuring the perceived bias by looking at the size as an estimator. Definitely. I mean, there may be individual differences as well, but they're definitely so. But we noticed this effect, uh, but we, we still haven't gotten to, uh, <laughs> to examine it. But I can say that the same visual angle when it was, it's like, I don't know if it's like the moon effect or whatever, but when it was on the upper part and the lower part, it didn't look like the same size. And that's why right. we... We, we added some arbitrary random uh, kind of sizing and asked people to ignore that so that it will not bias their judgments. Um, and a, a related question is, have you or have other people previously looked at memorability versus upper lower visual field? Um, maybe, I'm not, uh, I'm not familiar with that. Uh, so, but it's a great question. I can try to look into the literature, I don't know. I mean, um, in relate, visual short-term memory. In visual huh? short-term memory, Marisa, you have? Yes, uh, my former student, Leila Montaser Kusari, when she was a student here at NYU, published that. So the same asymmetries that we see with contrast and with resolution are preserved in, are preserved in visual short-term memory. I don't know about long-term memory. Okay, interesting. We will look into that, definitely. Okay, so Marisa knows better than me, <laughs> much more. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Amos? Um, regarding the virtual reality, reality experiment, there the virgin's mm -hmm. eye movement is always on the screen and does not depend on, on the distance. Do you find any difference between this and natural vision where it's changing all the time according to the distance? So I know that there are there that there are differences between VR uh, environments and um, and natural environments uh, with respect to uh, vision and also uh, to perceived distances. But 
uh, we have not yet measured. So the, the, the data that I've uh, showed and the experiment that we ran, although we've got uh, a component that can measure eye movements uh, within this device, we haven't um, activated it. Um, um, so we don't have eye movement data and I cannot say if the uh, virgins or uh, any aspect related to eye movements or oculomotor behavior is um, similar or different uh, within the VR environment relative to, um, let's say, naturalistic vision. It's not something that I can um, say at the moment, but maybe, the, again, maybe there are studies that have examined these aspects as well and have published things about them that I'm not familiar with yet. Okay. Thank you. Marisa? Yeah, I just wanted to, um, I was trying to go back to the beginning of the talk when you talk about ventral dorsal and then empty pad having representation of both. And then you show a lot of examples with real life where obviously there's a lot of motion, but then some of the experiments were with static images. So I just wanted to hear a little bit more of your thought of that. Um, and then just a quick comment. Uh, there are huge individual variances, as you said, in, in many measurements. We found them, for example, in the vertical meridian in contrast sensitivity, but they correlate really highly with the cortical magnification at V1 and V2. Um, so I don't know for later areas, uh, but, but there's, um, there's very rich correlations there. But that's a parenthesis. What I wanted to hear was just more your thoughts about the studies in which you have the static images and then yet the, the emphasis at the beginning into MT, which I found really interesting. So could you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, okay. So again, as you said, the information that um, uh, we used in the memory was really with static images. And so although I think that um, the, these, I, I think, for example, it could be that um, bigger uh, movie clips or would also be more memorable than small uh, <laughs> images. Um, there are many, these, first of all, are things that we have not tested yet, and I cannot be sure about that, uh, if indeed there is a difference. And also when we view um, uh, a movie or view uh, information, uh, I don't know where Marissa is. Um, Okay, ah, uh, here you are. <laughs> uh, when we view uh, information uh, in, um, let's say, um, dynamic information, as in movie clips, um, all of the streams are basically active or to some extent according to what we need to do. Now, since we haven't directed um, individuals' attention to specific tasks, we haven't asked them to make any judgments Again, there could be big variance in the way each of these people process the information, but it seems to me that in our uh, experiment, the ventral and dorsal, at least retinotopic areas were activated. Empty, I would assume, because of the um, static information or also the motion stream was probably very... Um, um, probably not activated or... If so, then to a very low extent. So I don't think MT or the motion stream contributed to any of the information that was uh, processed in our um, in our memory results. But definitely, it would be um, it would be uh, participating when we would um, if people would see movie clips, for example. And so again, it's hard for me to say if it would. Gen I mean, I would assume that it would generalize, but. Perhaps I may be wrong on, on this, and this has to be tested. I'm not sure, although, you know, MT does have retinotopy, so you can, can think about it as being, on the one hand, uh, very early, uh, even primary visual area, and then at the same time, some people consider it as high-level visual area. Uh, but since it has retinotopy, my assumption is that um, the, the fact that um, things would be bigger would occupy bigger space in MT and therefore may be contributing to uh, better memory. But again, I may be wrong. Thanks. Thank you. Um, okay, so Ella, did you raise your hand or you uh, decided not to? Uh, I decided to write it as a comment, but I might as well uh, speak up. Uh, thanks, Yaron, for the, the great talk. Um, I'm, I just, it's more of a comment than a question. Sorry about that. No, I just, 
recently heard an interesting talk by Lawrence Harris about the effects of gravity on, um, on distance and size. And I thought that could be an interesting interaction with your work to think about the ecological validity and effects of, of those kinds of things, that's all. Okay, well, that's interesting. So I would definitely look into that, but I'm not familiar with that. So I, I don't know what to uh, say, but definitely. So uh, again, I, we talked about size, but I can say that size uh, encompasses so many different components. So it's not just the visual field, but it's attention and it's visual, uh, um, it's eye, tra eye movements and uh, different spatial frequencies that um, um, evidence maybe in details and other aspects that contributed um, to this effect. So I don't think it's only that, but it's just an accumulative uh, effect of many uh, different components, but definitely your suggestion is um, interesting. Thank you. Uh, Marissa, are you still raising your hand or is it? Um... Okay. Um, so I guess um, that's uh, all for today. Thank you very much uh, to all of you for joining uh, and for uh, <laughs> sparing the time to uh, listen to my uh, talk. And um, next week we will not have um, a seminar, but we are continuing in two weeks. I think Wilma Bainbridge will be here, but I will post um, uh, the precise details. So have a great week and thanks for joining. Bye. Bye, thanks. Bye. Bye. Bye.